my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive. Six, seven, eight. Hello, BYWG Tribe. This is Dr. Noah. We wanted to make you aware of our never-before-featured Product of the Month and Book of the Month for March 2018. Keep in mind all the links, discount codes, and special offers for the delicious product and thought-changing book will be listed in the show notes in iTunes, in our weekly newsletter, and on our website at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com at the Listen Now tab. Our Product of the Month is Nikki's Coconut Butter, one of my favorite high healthy fat, low sugar treats. Please enjoy 15% off using our special code BYWG15. Our book of the month is The Abundance Code, How to Bust the Seven Money Myths for a Rich Life Now by Julie Ann Cairns. You can hear Nikki discussing Nikki's Coconut Butter on the March 5th Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast release and Julie discussing her book, The Abundance Code, in the archives on the February 12th, 2018 Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast release on iTunes and on our newly created YouTube channel. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer and I am your co-host. Today our guest is Dr. Lise Janelle. Uh, Dr. Lise is a relationship and empowerment coach helping people reconnect to their heart so they can live happy, grateful lives filled with love, inspiration, and success. With a background as a holistic chiropractor, Lise has developed and worked with leading edge mind-body tools that create quick and deep transformations from the inside out. Over the past 25 years, she has helped thousands of professionals, entrepreneurs, executives, artists, and many others find and dissolve beliefs that are holding them back so that they can unfold their greatest future. She's the author of Conversations with the Heart and You Are Loved. She's the creator of the Heart Freedom Method, a powerful mind-body tool that helps you find and dissolve self-sabotaging subconscious beliefs and patterns to unlock your full potential and create a successful mindset. Her Heart Freedom Certification Program is now available. Currently, she is co-writing her third book with Jack Canfield, author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series and the Success Principles, based on her Heart Freedom Method. Lise was born and raised in, I'm going to butcher this, Trois Rivieres, Quebec. Perfect. <laughs> she, is, <laughs> she is fluent in French and English and moved to Toronto to study at the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College. Upon graduation, she worked in Geneva, Switzerland for a year before making Toronto her home. Her recent accomplishment was climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. For more information, please visit our website at www.drleesjanelle.com. Woo! Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you, Noah. It's great. It's nice to be here. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad to have you on today. So... You know, I'm a chiropractor. My two partners are chiropractors, Lise. You were a chiropractor for 22 years. Um, how and why did you make the transition from chiropractor to being a coach? Yes, that was such a hard decision. I loved being a chiropractor. I love my lifestyle. I love my, my patients had such amazing transformations. They loved me. It was, it was you know, it's like having a big family Some. Some people I knew when they were in the belly of their mother, you know, so <laughs> I love being a chiropractor and I still believe in chiropractic, except I had a calling inside of me and I, I still feel like actually I am a chiropractor because when you're a chiropractor, what you do is you remove the interference with the healing power of the body, the innate intelligence of the body. And now as a coach, the type of coaching I do, what I do is I remove the the blocks to the spiritual expression of a human being. Because for me, the natural state of a human being is to be healthy. And we only have disease when there is a block. And for me, the natural state of a human being is to experience happiness and success. And we only have a problem expressing that when we have a block. And the biggest block we all have that prevents us from having happiness is deep down at the core, the illusion that something is wrong with us for not having what we want in life. That somehow, because we're not getting all the time the things we're asking for, that something 
something is missing in us and it closes down the heart and gets us to feel emotions that then impacts our genes. <laughs> yeah. Per perfect uh, segue with our name beyond your wildest genes. <laughs> yeah, I love I love the name of your podcast. So I, I'm assuming you're going to address this challenge in your upcoming summit, the Love versus Infatuation Summit. Is that fair enough to say? Yes. Um, yeah, the Love versus Infatuation Summit. I this this I'm so very excited to create that because I really feel that the at the core of 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 our problems as you know as human beings is, is the battle between both of them so from march 19 to 23rd we're going to have like 22 experts i'm going to secret surprise speaker as well <laughs> amazing transformational leader we have like john gray men are from mars women are from venus katie hendrix who's who's been on oprah like three or four times we also have uh sherry salata who was the producer of of ohm and the Oprah networks. I have an amazing lineup of people, but the reason why I'm, I'm so juiced by this is because I really feel that if, if as human beings, we can understand the difference between infatuation and love, we could transform the planet because that's what happened to me in 1989. I was studying with John Demartini. So he's my mentor at the core of, of all the stuff that I have learned. And I really learned the difference between infatuation, which is which is the stuff that, you know, we're fed on the radios and the songs we listen to on, on TV in the romance novels we read. Like it's all the time about infatuation, like the butterflies and the stomach, like can't sleep at night, the, the flutters when we see the person, feeling like we can't imagine living without this person. And that intensity always swings to the other side where we get depressed and hurt and addicted and unhappy when it swings to the other side because it always swings to the other side. I don't know of anybody, and experts will tell you that you can't remain infatuated at the most more than three years. <laughs> As, and and so people end up confusing those experiences with love. And then they are afraid of love. When in fact, what they are afraid of is infatuation. And, and it is so sad because it happens once and then maybe you take a chance. Another time you, you let yourself become infatuated again, thinking this is love. And you, you, you trusting the butterfly in your stomach as a sign that, you know, I'm, uh, this is love. And then because it doesn't work out, now you, you, you start creating a story that, oh, maybe I'll never be able to have love. Maybe I'll never be able to find this person that can come and make my life better, that's going to enlighten and make me happy. And then because of that, we shut down and we create in our genes the epigenetic effect of that is super dangerous. And um, I interviewed Dr. Wanda Lee for my summit on this because I wanted her to come and e express this, that when we feel emotions versus love, love is healing. You might have heard of Anita Morjani. She has a book called Dying to Be Me. Right. in which she speaks about dying. She was dying from cancer, and then she realized the reason she was dying was because she hadn't loved who she was. And that she knew that if she came back, she would heal. So this, she decided, because her husband and her mother were there crying beside her deathbed, to come back, and within five days, everything was gone. She didn't have cancer anymore. So... The power of love is super important for healing, for transformation, for happiness. For, for me, that's the key for success in life. The key to happiness is to learn the difference between love and infatuation. Well, then let's, let's – you touched on a couple of topics and that I'm going to all reach uh, – eventually get to. But let's start at the base on what, what is love in your perspective and then what is infatuation from your perspective? All right. So for me, love is our essence. Love is who we are. It is not an emotion. It is when I help people get into their heart, the only thing that lives in the heart is love, gratitude, inspiration, and wisdom. Love, 
gratitude, inspiration, and wisdom. And when you have those, you have power. So that's not an emotion. So love, if we all remembered who we are at the core, would be Buddha-like. <laughs> Nothing would be missing. We have no desire for anything. I, I have, that's a, that's a, an interesting um powerful meditation I created and the listener can have access to it. It's called heartfreedommeditation.com, heartfreedommeditation.com. Okay. And when you do this meditation at the end, you're in your heart, you're in a state of gratitude and love. And I ask people, is anything missing right now? And people feel, no. Do you feel safe? And people feel, yeah, I'm safe. Do you feel abundant? And people will say, yeah. And I say to women, do you feel beautiful? And yeah. So when we're in the heart, nothing is missing. And we all have access to that. But we get subluxated. We get <laughs> disconnected from this knowing with fear. Because this is like the cosmic joke, the divine joke played on us is that right from the get-go, when we are born, love has to come from the outside. And if you cry as a baby and mommy comes or daddy whoever is the primary caregiver you feel like wow i'm powerful i'm worthy like i can have anything i want in life but if you cry which often happened to us our generation and they would put you in a nursery and you would be on a feeding time schedule you could cry and cry and cry and cry 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 cry, cry and no one would come and then you start creating stories about yourself. What's wrong with me? I'm unworthy of love. I don't want to ask for what I want because if, if I ask for what I want and no one comes, then it hurts too much. I'm going to stop asking for what I want. And because we disconnect from the heart, then we feel less than. We, dec we decrease our worth. And then when someone comes along and makes us feel like, wow, I am seen, someone thinks I'm great, now we become totally infatuated with them. Or if we feel they have something we don't have that we cannot give ourselves, we become infatuated with them. And that's how we learn the difference. That's how we learn the difference between love and infatuation. So love is quiet. If, if you feel love, it's quiet. Parents who have children, they have, you know, it's quiet. It's not like you can't sleep at night because you think about your kids. You're, you love them. There's a give. There's a receiving. There's beautiful exchange of energy. And that's, that's interesting, too, because I was um, interviewing one of the experts, and he said, the difference between love and infatuation is when you're in a loving relationship, both people are uh, are." giving and receiving. When you're in an infatuation relationship, one person is giving and the other one is receiving. And I thought, huh, that's a very good uh, differentiation. So the difference between love, love is quiet. Love allows you to explore all the different areas of your life. When you're infatuated, you're on a big high. You see more pleasure than pain. There's nothing they can do that they can do wrong. They, they smell good, they look good, even if, you know, if they're farting, it, it's beautiful. <laughs> right. And, and it's so intense, it's, a, it's an addictive high. And some people actually are serial monogamous because they go from one stage of infatuation to the next stage of infatuation and they're unable to discover the beauty of love. I, th I think it's your mentor, John Martini, who said, everything is love, all else is an illusion. Is that correct? Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> but we need to wake up from the illusion, and that's the challenge as human beings. Right, right. Now, what are there has to be some upside <clears throat> to infatuation at times. Is What is that upside? Yes. Well, the upside of infatuation is that it gives you the courage to start a relationship with someone. There you go. I knew that. I knew there was some some benefit. I knew it. Well, there are two ways of getting into a relationship, into a romantic relationship. Either you know someone for a long time and you're friends, and because you're friends and you get to trust each other, you get to know the essence of each other. You can then take it to the next level 
So that's one way. I, in my opinion, it's the wise way. It's the easier way. It's the less scary way. Right. And the other one is infatuation. And it's a mechanism that was put, I'm sure, in our biology for procreation. Because, you know, you go to the coffee shop and then you see this person sitting at the table. And all of a sudden, like, you wow, music starts playing like the hand of God descends upon you and it's like oh my this is my soulmate and like then you go and like you finish each other's sentences and it's like wow and, and we just jump in it and it, it catches us the thing is there's nothing wrong with infatuation as long as we understand that this is not love yet I'm going to use it I'm going to ride it I'm going to allow myself to feel it but I am not going to confuse infatuation with love. And the, the best way of being safe from infatuation is to make sure that you keep living your highest values. So if for you being healthy is important and you get up in the morning, you have a healthy breakfast and you like going to the gym X amount of time or going outside, you have girlfriends, boyfriends, you visit, you keep your life doing the things that matter to you so that you don't give away your whole being to another person. Because when you're infatuated with someone, like the listeners right now, if you take your hands and you put your index finger to your thumbs on each side, now you have two circles. So one circle represents you, the other circle represents the person you're infatuated with. If you bring your two circles on top of each other, that's what infatuation is. Hmm. So if you look at the two circles on top of each other, there's um, one circle is redundant. So the universe, the energy in the universe won't let that happen. So two circles on top of each other always leads to two circles apart. Hmm. And, you know, when, when you are infatuated with someone, you have amazing makeup sex. <laughs> That's what this is all about. So, like, you go from blending into each other, melting into each other, to having a huge fight, to then having incredible sex that brings you back together. And we go back and forth and back and forth that way. Until one day, if we're wise enough, we realize that these two circles, what they need to do is they need to intersect. And when the two circles are intersecting, now you're you're loving. This is love. You're in charge of your own happiness. Your mate is in charge of their happiness. You have a commitment to spending, you know, your life together and growing and learning and challenging each other and supporting each other and going through the highs and lows of life together. But each individual is in charge of their own happiness. Exactly. Exactly. Now, what's the flip side? What are the drawbacks of love? Well, the drawbacks of love is you definitely – if you want to have a truly loving relationship, it's like having children. <laughs> like parents will tell you they love their children, but there's a lot of reorganizing of your time. And you need to be conscious. So that to the drawbacks of loving is you, you need to you need to be organized. You cannot just all of a sudden go for what's easy. You need a conscious commitment to first making it work. It's not going to be like the, the fairy tale story that we hear. So the drawbacks of love over, over infatuation is that it demands some work. And the work is to be conscious. And not just let the high guide you, but to go into your heart and decide, okay, I'm going to make this relationship work. Just like being healthy. This whole podcast is about being healthy and having wellness if you want to be healthy and have wellness you need to commit to it right you, you need you need to take full responsibility for it you you get you no know, regular adjustments you watch your diet you exercise you make a commitment to living a healthy life and it's the same thing with a relationship you make a commitment to being happy together and just like a commitment to being healthy demands that you work at it, the benefits are you are healthy. And some people choose instead to take a pill. Okay, so I'm going to take a pill. I'm going to numb all my symptoms. 
But slowly but surely, you you know you're destroying your digestive system, your liver, your kidneys. You're just getting sicker and sicker when you can't find when you don't take the time to dissolve the cause for your for your illness. It's the same thing with relationship. Okay, I can go for infatuation after infatuation after infatuation just to numb the symptoms of my unhappiness, or I can can decide to commit to a being and being with that person and the commitment to that person is I'm going to make sure that I work on my own happiness because being with someone who's miserable is not fun. So so that leads me to my next question, which is a great segue. How, how do you know if you're in love with somebody as opposed to being infatuated with somebody? Yeah, it, someone, uh, Marcy Shine, I'm off at our interview. She she said something really cool. She said she has a book called Love for No Reason. And when you love someone, you just love them because you love them. <laughs> when you're infatuated with someone, you love them because they can make you feel good. They make you feel amazing. They they bring the best out of you. They they uh, they provide financial security. Uh, they make you feel like you're cool, you know, you have this hot babe on your arms, like like whatever we need the other person to be to make up for our what we feel is our own inadequacy, that's when we're infatuated. All right, there's attachments to a fat infatuation. Yes, and every time you have an attachment, if you lose what you're attached to, then it hurts. If you have something outside yourself that is Defining who you are, would it be money, would it be career, social status, uh, even children? Like my my brother died when he was 21 years old and my mom, you know, if she had defined herself as a mother, losing her child would, would have killed her. It was not easy for sure, but my mom was quite wise and she said, yeah, well, he was just lent to, to me it was not mine to own so we really need and, and that's what the love versus infatuation summit is not only about romantic uh love infatuation it's about the different areas of our lives where we can become so infatuated with an idea about something and we see only positive we don't see both sides that it costs us we go on these big tangents just to realize I never was wise enough to look at both sides of the situation. I had, I, I was speaking with one of my young um, coaching clients. She's only 19 years old. And when she came to see me, her parents sent her to me because she was unhappy and ungrateful. And like her whole life has transformed. And I asked her, so what is it that you learned the most? She says, you know, I don't want this to sound bad, but, what was really good f that came from you is you make me realize that life was harsh. <laughs> <laughs> that actually I had to do things that it was not always going to be easy. That if I wanted something, I had to involve myself into it. And I had to give something to it. And I thought, huh, that this is really good. Like I felt like a good mom <laughs> with my child. But this is one of the reasons I, I really want to debunk love and infatuation because we get so hurt when we're not getting only pleasure out of a relationship that we think it's not love. When love is actually supporting and, and challenging us. Now, Lise, do you need to have strong self-love before you can love somebody else? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, feeling worthy of love is certainly a key ingredient for being able to be in a in a fulfilling relationship. But, you know, if you're 20, you don't know who you are, you don't know what love is, like self-love is this foreign concept. Like, so are you supposed to be single for the rest of your life until you, you decide that and now I'm worthy of love? So um, for me, a relationship is a beautiful mechanism in place for spiritual evolution because this is super super important to know that 
the aim of a romantic relationship is not to make us happy, which is what we're deep down seeking. I want to find someone to make me happy, to make me whole, or to make us miserable, because that's what seems to happen to a lot of people. Like their romantic life has made them miserable. Because the aim of a relationship is actually to teach us how to love. Because when we love, we feel happy. That's true happiness. It's not infatuation high happiness. Is that love brings us happiness because there's nothing that feels better than being able to give and receive in exchange. So... so if you're asking me, do we need to have self-love to be in a loving relationship? Yes. But what's going to happen is a relationship is an opportunity for you to learn to love. And if you're listening right now and you're divorced or you're young and you only had two or three relationships and they never went anywhere, don't be disheartened. Don't be hurt. Just realize that through the relationships you've experienced, they were perfect mechanisms for you to shine a light as to where it is you didn't know about love and how to love another being, but most important, what it means to love yourself when you're in a relationship. And uh, uh, the best definition I've been able to come up with to describe a healthy, loving relationship is love is wanting the best for our partner or forever the person we're with. So love is wanting the best for another person while respecting our needs. So that demands like a dance. It's a dance that ha happens back and forth and back and forth where you put value on your partner, you respect and honor them and want the best for them. Don't wish ill on them. But you do the same for yourself. You, it's about, that's why it's called often the art of love is you, you keep each other in in mind, you make each other important. You're consciously connecting with each other, wanting the best for each other and respecting each other's needs. That was a long answer to your question. <laughs> oh, it was a very, it was a very good answer. Now, you, you mentioned you interviewed uh, one of our partners, uh, Dr. Wanda Lee, for this upcoming summit. And I had an opportunity to look at the notes that she, t she put together for the interview and uh, the the notes themselves are fantastic. What did, what did you think about Wanda Lee's uh, presentation? Yes, well, I love. That's why I wanted to have Wanda Lee with on on the summit is because the epigenetic effect of love on our health is what is most people are not aware of it, and that through what she shared with our listeners was that a consciousness shining a light on the ex the importance of loving like our genes we, we we you can have so for example you can be born with rheumatoid arthritis genes and you can turn them on and off with love so you, you have a huge impact on on your health by either loving who you are and other beings or shutting down your heart and experiencing emotions because emotions increase cortisol levels in the, the body. Increased cortisol levels create inflammation and inflammation leads to you know, arthritis, heart disease, cancer. So all of these things get activated when we're not in the heart, when we're not loving. Right, yeah. Right. Um, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to listening to her full interview for sure. Now, how, how close is gratitude when compared to love do they go hand in hand are they different yeah that's a very good question i believe you cannot separate love from gratitude and you cannot have gratitude without love right and that's the key for happiness the other day i was coaching this little kid she's 10 years old and she was so upset because her grandfather came to surprise her. She she loves going to see the Raptors, the basketball team in Toronto. Yep. And her grandfather came to surprise her to take her to the basketball game. 
And she had not imagined, she was 10 years old, she had not planned for it. So she was upset she didn't want to go. And she was so mad at her mom and her grandfather at 10 years old because they wanted to take her to the Raptors game, which she usually would love to go. And yes, I understand, you know, as an adult, all these things, but as a little kid, I don't know if you, if I, if my father, my grandfather had come and wanted to take me to anything, I would have been so grateful. And because she was not grateful, she was unhappy. Right. So being grateful brings love. So the grandfather got hurt there because imagine you're the grandfather, you show up at the door and like you're all looking forward to taking your little granddaughter to a basketball game and instead like she's making it like she doesn't want to come with you like so you you don't feel appreciated so appreciation gratitude and love go together so we talked about this we showed her the bigger picture and and it was much better for her afterwards like she understood something that she like if i 10 years old you can teach if you have kids right now the most important thing you can do to help your kids is teach them gratitude because they can have everything in the world and if it's never enough if it's never is gratitude for it they're going to be miserable <laughs> good point i have two young kids young sons myself 13 and 8 so i i couldn't agree more <laughs> i couldn't agree more 13 yeah Yes. Tough age. 13 to tough age, Lise. Whew, baby. Tough age. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, I often use <clears throat> I often use a uh, an analogy that works well with adults and children. And that it's a corny story, but it's a beautiful corny story. It's the, the scientist is observing a butterfly coming out of a cocoon. It's a huge struggle. It takes hours and hours and hours. So the scientist to be nice to the butterfly he cuts the cocoon open. But because he does that, the butterfly has nothing to struggle against. So its wings are weak. It can never fly. And it dies like that. So we can bring gratitude into any challenge. So if you're a parent listening right now and you want to bring gratitude into your children's life, you can tell them this story. It works extremely well. And you tell them, you know, I love you. I'm your parent. And I want you to live an amazing life. And for that, I know you need to have strong wings. So how about we choose some challenges for you so that you can build your wings? Right. And you know what? That, that creates self-confidence. That creates... Uh, pride in themselves. They feel happy. It's like Rocky. You know the movie Rocky when he stands at the top of the stairs? When a kid does that, then they feel grateful. They get feel grateful for you believing in them and challenging them even though they were scared. It makes them feel good about themselves who work through their fears because to live an amazing life as a human being, you need courage. And if you look at the word courage, it has a French word cœur in it which is French for heart. So to live an amazing life, you need courage. So that's one way as a parent you can help them gain gratitude is by choosing with them challenges to make their wings stronger. And sometimes if they come home and something challenging happened, you can ask them, so how did that build your wings? <laughs> how did that make you stronger? And if you start your kids at a very young age to look for the blessings and the challenges, the benefits and the challenges, you're allowing them to have gratitude. Because <clears throat> I've asked this question to thousands of people. I do public speaking sometimes, and I, last time I like, had 350 people in the room, and I say, raise your hand if you've never experienced huge challenges in your life. And guess what? Nobody raised their hand. And in years and years of thousands of people asking these questions, only once did I have a young lady saying, I never had huge challenges. And she says, and you know what? It scares me because I know I'm not equipped for when something happens. Right. So if we are smart as human beings, the key is not to look for a life without challenges. That's why I often, I, I, if you were in front of me right now, I always use the yin and the yang, the dark and the light side. And I, and I really help my clients see this is that the game, if you're a smart 
human being is not to try to create only a light side of the equation. In coaching terms, we call that an unwinnable game. Because nobody has ever succeeded in only experiencing pleasure and comfort. So that if you're a smart human being, what you do is you learn to use both sides of your life, the pleasure and the challenges, to grow more in gratitude for everything that happens so you can connect with your heart, so you can experience love, so you can experience fulfillment, as opposed to the infatuation with searching only pleasure. Which never works, which is guarantee. I guarantee you, you're going to be miserable. And when you're miserable, you impact your genes, for yeah. sure. <laughs> Increase your inflammation, the cortisol levels, everything is going to go with that. Yeah, it's it. It can't be. It can't be said enough. Um, now, all all the links to the summit is going to be in the show notes and everywhere that it needs to be, so people can get uh, get their hands on this. But th there's a free um, listening window. When is that window, please? Okay, so if someone wants to listen to the join join in because you're going to have amazing interviews with top experts i really hope you join us to get all these differences between love and infatuation in different areas of your life um it's the interviews are between the 19th to the 23rd and on the 24th i'm going to do a special q a session for people who, who come in and it's free it's free so you can listen to it. It's free for 24 hours. So as long as you listen to them within 24 hours, it's it's yours for you to have. And and the URL is easy. It's globalheartliving.com. Globalheartliving.com. You just click there and um, you'll have access to everything, all the information. You're going to get emails. You just have to opt in again to make sure that you receive the your your information and that you know, the stuff doesn't end up in your spam filter and uh we'll have an amazing time together yeah i i totally agree that is an important uh to watch watch because sometimes some of this the second opt-in ends up in your junk so you do have to opt in again so you get everything all the special emails all the interviews that's a very important uh uh comment so please pay attention to that folks uh, Dr. Leeds, I have one last question for you, and it's a question I end all my interviews with, um, and it's kind of a fun question. What is what is the day in the life of Dr. Leeds look like? What kind of routines, rhythms uh, do you do every single day to, to make sure your day is as productive and as beneficial to you and others as possible? You know, for me, the biggest, most important thing for me to do is to be in the flow i don't i i've been very regimented in the past like i was a competitive rower for 17 years i was up like at a quarter to five every morning i went rowing went mm -hmm. to work went ro rowing at night again so for me it's about feeling and listening to my body so the things i will fit in my in my day to is i'm going to meditate i'm going to play with my little little dog i will connect with my mate i will i will um exercise for me exercising is super important i often do intermittent fasting so i skip one meal because i i feel it in my body it changes how i feel i feel more energized it, it switches my body from using glucose as main fuel to using ketones as main fuels and has a big impact on my my brain i i'm so clean in my thinking when uh, ketone is my fuel and um yeah being outside in nature is super important so i i spend i'm less enough to be able to spend half the time in the city where the culture and passion and all these things happen and then the other part in at the in the countryside at my cottage in in nature and being by the water and in the trees and it's beautiful. I, I just love the, the balance of both. I, I have, I'm blessed with having a balance of city time and nature time. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Like I said, all the appropriate links to the free ticket to this incredible summit will be in the show notes. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer, your co-host, and you are listening to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. If you'd like what you've heard today, please share this with your friends and family and encourage them to subscribe on iTunes. 
Thank you. And as my oldest son Hayden says, be awesome and never unawesome. <laughs> Get my shoes and out the door Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling